What do you do if you run out of power? Why not get yourself one of these? Welcome to Click, I'm Spencer Kelly, and welcome to one of the strangest places I have ever been, where the Earth is literally alive with energy. So much so that the country gets its power by simply plugging into the planet. This is Iceland. I'm on a spectacular journey to meet the people making the most of both nature's forces and the tech know-how that's unique to this island. Why does this robot have a taste for blood? Love is in the air here, but only if their smartphones agree. And I'll meet the woman who's won much more than just a trophy for being a prize geek. Time for Click to get up and go. And this time, we're heading towards the top of the world. At almost 67 degrees north and just nudging the Arctic Circle, Iceland is home to 320,000 people, all living on top of a plume of superheated rock in the middle of the Atlantic. The volcanic activity that formed the island 50 million years ago still churns away today, continually changing a landscape that is both otherworldly and completely spectacular. The sat-navs here know that too. In fact, if you're not in a hurry, they can be programmed to take you out of your way and take in some of the island's wonders. You choose from one of a number of different driving tours, and as the sat-nav guides you around Iceland, it'll tell you about the various points of interest that you pass on the way. The area we're driving through is called Thrastarskogur Woods. Also coming up is one of Iceland's richest salmon rivers, the river Sog, which flows out of Lake the country's economy has also had a bit of a rocky ride of late. After its banking industry famously went south, it now relies on tourism more than ever before. But while the visitors enjoy one natural resource, the locals are taking full advantage of another. Iceland has, to all intents and purposes, an unlimited supply of heat. Water that seeps just a short distance down into the crust bursts back to the surface as superheated steam and mud. The first benefit for Icelanders is free central heating. The naturally warmed water is stored in these suitably futuristic looking tanks overlooking the capital, Reykjavik. And it also means extremely cheap and environmentally friendly power. The high pressure steam is used to turn turbines at geothermal power stations hiding away in the sulphurous mists. In fact, the country is looking towards becoming the first to run completely on renewable energy. And it's got so much of the stuff, it's now inviting technology companies to relocate here to have some of it. Behind most large companies in the world these days are these things, computer servers. They used to store all of the data and do all of the number crunching. In fact, if you do any cloud computing, your emails and your documents will be stored in data centers like this. Now, these things take an enormous amount of power to keep them running, but interestingly, they use about as much power again just to keep the things cool. In fact, that's what's making most of the noise in here. It's the fans inside these units blowing air over all the kits. Well, not only does Iceland have all of this electricity going spare, it also has something else in plentiful supply too. Cold air. While the heat below ground provides that cheap power, the cool conditions above ground remove the need for power-hungry chillers. Not that Iceland is alone in offering a cool place to house your data. Globally, data centers are moving north to chillier climes, but recently Facebook chose to build its first European data center, not in Iceland, but in Sweden. 
I asked Fern Global's boss if Iceland might struggle to lure all that sensitive and precious data into the country. What with all those active volcanoes just up the road? In Iceland, our site is located to the west, um, and the volcanoes happen to be to the east. So these wonderful volcanoes that produce this geothermal energy, uh, if there was to be an eruption, the prevailing winds carry any of that ash to the east. Data centers are among the fastest growing consumers of energy, and reducing that consumption is moving higher and higher up the environmental agenda. But in order to reach its 100% renewable energy target, Iceland needs to tame a beast that's been around for more than 100 years, the motor car. As long as Iceland relies on petrol, it can't be completely green. Now, the Icelandic government has pledged that 10% of all transport fuel will be eco-friendly by 2020. It's considering hydrogen cars, methane cars powered by the gases that come from rubbish, and electric cars, which surely should be the obvious choice here. After all, three quarters of Icelanders live in or around Reykjavik, and city driving is what electric vehicles do best. And yet, the grand total of electric vehicles in Iceland at the moment is 30. So, what's the problem? I went to meet the Gunnarsson family. Today, they drive a diesel-powered 4x4, but they've been part of a government experiment and were given an electric and a hydrogen car to test out. Now, the hydrogen car wasn't a goer because there weren't many filling stations, but the electric car could be charged very cheaply at home. So why have they gone back to diesel? They are expensive at the moment. They are too expensive. Yeah. They are small and expensive, but I think they will get cheaper. I think there are two main problems. The, the cost of the car when you start it and the, the range you can drive it. We got almost up to 100 kilometers on one charge. It was in the end of the testing period when I had learned to, to drive the car and not have the radi radiator on when I didn't need it, not listen to the radio when I was not uh, listening to anything <laughs> especially, and things like that. But there is another theory as to why alternative fuel cars haven't taken off here. Take a look at what people do drive here. There's a lot of 4x4s, and that's because there's so much off-roading and rough terrain driving to be had here in Iceland. And how many electric SUVs have you ever seen? One man, at least, is undeterred. He's an electric fan. As in fanatic, not actually a fan. Although it was quite windy when I chased him up a hillside on his two-wheeled electric vehicle of choice. Gisli Gislason is an entrepreneur who's one of Iceland's biggest proponents of electric transport. And he's adamant that those concerns about range are unjustified. I think 90% of the people in Iceland doesn't drive more than 35 kilometers per day. So why do you need long range cars? You know, we have thousands of filling stations for the car at your home. And uh, it's my opinion that, you know, 90% 90 90 of the people will actually charge at home overnight, which is very easy. The most popular alternative fuel car here is the methane car, which yes. runs off rubbish. Yes, yes. How, how green is that? Why, why are they so popular? Actually, uh, they are more like gasoline cars, you know, you're burning something. And people actually, they really don't understand, you know, how can a small motor take this car even faster than the gasoline car? And uh, it's, it's, it's changing, it will happen. Gisli, thanks. No problem. Let's go for a ride. For all of Gisli's enthusiasm and Iceland's endless supply of green energy, it does seem that electric vehicles face as much of an uphill struggle here as everywhere else in the world. Personally, I think it's all been a bit exhausting. Time for a soak. Just one more curious use of Iceland's geothermal power for you. The country's well known for having pools like this which bathers can come and soak their troubles away in, but this one isn't strictly natural. Now, just over there, through the steam, is a geothermal power station, which is taking the steam from the ground, turning the turbines and changing it into electricity. Once the steam has cooled into warm water, it ends up here in a 
man-made but naturally heated lagoon. Hi, this is Spencer. Thanks for calling. I'm abroad filming at the moment and unable to take your call due to the hectic schedule. So please leave a message. Thanks. Kelly, it's the boss. You should have been back in the office two days ago. Call me. And back to Iceland in a couple of minutes after this week's tech news, which starts with Microsoft. Its original Surface tablet didn't sell well. In fact, it cost the company $900 million in written off unsold stock. But undaunted, it's launched new versions of its Windows 8 powered tablet. Dubbed Surface 2, it sports a faster processor, higher resolution screen and camera and improved battery life. Pricing for the lower spec RT models with 32 gig of storage starts at £359, while the most expensive Surface Pro 2 with 512 gig costs £1,439. 19 so-called reputation enhancement firms have been fined a total of £219,000 after being outed for writing fake online reviews for their clients. Operation Clean Turf lured the companies by posing as a non-existent Brooklyn yogurt shop that had attracted a chilly online reception. Charging as little as a dollar a post, some of the companies deployed an army of bogus online personas tasked with defrosting the shop's online presence. In the week that the fingerprint security feature in Apple's new iPhone 5S was hacked by Germany's Chaos Computer Club, a fake advert has fooled some users into believing that upgrading to the new operating system iOS 7 will make their Apple mobile device waterproof. The ad spread via social media sites and was so convincing that many broke their gadgets putting it to the test. Unlike Sony's Xperia Z range, Apple's mobile products are not waterproof. And finally, if you're wondering why the professional pilot is getting out of the very expensive fighter jet, then you're in good company. Boeing has revealed a retrofitted F-16 that can be flown remotely from the ground. During the test, two on-ground pilots manoeuvred the plane through 9 Gs of acceleration up to a top speed of Mach 1.47. That's nearly one and a half times the speed of sound to you and me. The fighter was tailed by two chase planes and it had a self-destruct system installed, which fortunately wasn't needed. I've ditched the car and decided to explore Iceland's capital. This place feels more like a town than a city. Reykjavik itself may be home to just 120,000 people, but it's not lacking any of today's mod cons. I never thought I'd be complimenting a city on the beauty of its hot water tanks, but you can see why they call that place the Pearl, can't you? Anyway, I've come to this hill overlooking Reykjavik to find where I'm off to next. Now, it's a university, but I'm told the students aren't quite what you'd expect. My name is Raquel Solotothir, and I've created a new way to teach kids how to code from the age of six. I think it all started when I was a kid myself. My parents gave me a Sinclair Spectrum computer when I was nine. Uh, I can still remember that day when I got that computer, plugged it into the tape recorder and the TV, and started to program my own games. Rachel suffers from Attention Deficit and Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. So she wanted to create a way to pass on her computer skills in a way which was especially easy for those with conditions we traditionally believe hamper the learning process. When I saw my kid, he has ADHD as well, when I saw him going through the same struggle as I had to go through through school system, I felt that something needed to change. Rachel doesn't use Box, nor does she ask children to deal with laborious debugging or to scan lines of code for syntax errors. She uses 3D graphical interfaces like Minecraft and Alice, games that help youngsters understand the basics of telling a computer what to do. Here, characters, objects and even the wider online world are created along with rules which govern how they'll react if certain things happen. Twenty different worlds created in just one morning. Called Schema, Rachel mixes technology, lessons from educational studies and psychology. One golden rule is that everyone needs to be happy, even if they need to fake it for a bit. So if we bite it with our teeth, 
So now my brain thinks I'm happy. Just by starting to smile, we want to smile more. So it's about these cheek muscles, like you saw earlier. Uh, they control the activity in the brain. So these muscles send neuro signs to the brain and the brain says, okay, you're happy. I'm going to create endorphin to make you even happier. Uh, within that process, uh, a gateway opens up to the long-term memory. So we need to get the kids and ourselves happy so that we can put the information we're supposed to learn into the long-term memory. Another technique is to make sure the children also learn from their peers so they begin to teach each other with often positive results beyond the classroom. We have uh, yeah, 16 employees from the age of 8 to 16. Many of those kids that are assistant teachers have disabilities like autism, ADHD, Asperger, but they're doing an amazing job. Arni has Asperger syndrome and he was bullied. He didn't fit in, but the Raki came and took him out from the classroom and let him teach all the kids in school. Yeah. And that was brilliant. He went from being a nobody and loser and uh, became a winner. After teaching 1,700 kids, Schema is now gaining international attention. Lessons begin in Barcelona and in Redmond in the US next month. And a new center opens in the States next year. And with interest from Denmark, Sweden and Slovenia, this innovative project could turn out to be one of Iceland's best exports. Iceland may be looking outwards, but it's also had to look inwards. We may all be created differently in this world, but on this isolated island, that's not so much the case. There hasn't been much immigration here, and that means that there's not as much genetic diversity as there is on larger land masses. Go back just a few generations, and most Icelanders will find that they're related to each other. So, it's the same old story. Boy meets girl, girl likes boy, girl and boy bump smartphones. Girl's app checks if she's too closely related to the boy. App says no, so go for it. Oh, yeah. Ingeborg Rosa is one Icelander who's found new ways to use this app to avoid, shall we say, embarrassing situations. It's very convenient to look up the guys you meet when you're maybe downtown, you see a cute guy or you meet someone really interesting. Um, yeah, look him up there and, and see whether he's related to you or not. And, and how, how closely related is too closely related? Third cousin, I would say. Third cousin? Yeah. You wouldn't want to marry your third cousin and have babies with him, would you? Okay, so, so third cousin is just for... Um, uh, fourth cousin, cousin is fine. The fourth cousin is fine. Yeah, okay. yeah. After all, this is Iceland. <laughs> We're embarrassed. All the information for the app comes from the nation's genealogy records. Called the Book of Iceland, it's a serious endeavour. Pretty accurate written records go back to 1703. The book allows people here to discover exactly how they're linked to almost anyone else from Iceland. In the past, the population has dipped to just 30,000 here, so there's useful information dating back over a thousand years. The boss of DNA analysts Decode told me that this database is helping us to understand many conditions across the world, like schizophrenia, diabetes and many cancers. There is a so-called founder effect in Iceland, which means that we can we can trace everyone who has a particular disease to a relatively few individuals who lived a few centuries back. So the reason for a disease is very likely to be the same in most people in Iceland who have the disease. A large section of the population here has given blood to the firm to help it assist research globally. Now, once these samples are taken, they're not just kept for weeks, or even months, it makes sense to keep them for as long as is possible for research or pattern matching that might happen years in the future. And that's why the blood of Iceland ends up here in this biobank of half a million samples, the oldest of which was taken 15 years ago. And the reason that even that sample is still good today is that the temperature in here 
is minus 26 Celsius, or as Icelanders call it, mild. So, as the robots continue to serve up these samples, hopefully those discovering their personal connections to each other won't get such a frosty reception. And believe it or not, here we are in the middle of Reykjavik playing Cupid because those two hadn't even met before we asked them to bump their phones together. So who knows where that might lead? Although I do have to tell you, they did walk off in separate directions at the end. There you go. Now that's one way to use your smartphone. Here are quite a few more, courtesy of Kate Russell and Webscape. You don't need your own blood bank or shelves stacked with ancient record books to chart your family history because wherever you are in the world, you can go online and have a website do most of the hard work for you. That's exactly why MyHeritage has over 75 million users who've collectively compiled almost 30 million family trees using the simple build and research interface on their website. We'll just add another limb to the family tree. As well as searching through millions of records and completed family trees manually, once you start adding details to your own clan collection, the smart search technology will automatically start scanning historic records and other trees for any connections it can make for you. It might take a little while for the results to come back, but once they do, who knows what you'll discover. The basic features are free to use, including apps for iPhone and Android. You can even invite your family to collaborate and build the tree together. There are naturally premium upgrades for more detailed trees and storage for images, as well as deeper historic searches. We'll just add another limb to the family tree. Talking of historic events, remember when you first joined Twitter? For Click, it was the 11th of July 2007. You can find out your Twitter birthday at the rather naffly named site of the same name. One of Twitter's best kept secrets is at Magic Rex, an experimental account you can follow to receive direct messages if anything is happening inside your social graph that you should be aware of. For example, when several of the accounts that you follow all follow a new user. Like this notification that I received recently. If you fancy a trip to Iceland now, Skyscanner has just added Windows Phone 7 and 8 apps to its range of free apps that let you search through millions of routes from thousands of airlines, with prices updated in real time. I am a passenger, and I ride and I ride. With apps for every smartphone platform, this is a great way to stay on top of travel prices wherever you happen to be. And in the Windows Phone apps, you can add a tile to your home page to track a particular flight with a price updating automatically every hour. And when you get there, you can save money with peer-to-peer -peer rental giant Airbnb's latest smartphone apps, now available free on Apple and Android devices. Kate Russell's Webscape, and that is it from Click in Iceland. Hope you've enjoyed our tour of some of the amazing technology that's on this tiny island. Everything from today's programme is up at our website, bbc.co.uk slash click. And if you'd like to comment on anything you've seen, you can email click at bbc.co.uk or find us on Twitter, Google Plus and Facebook. Thank you very much for watching and we will see you next time.